Hi students, um, I am making a series of video recordings today um, about our anti-racism uh, uh, unit within this class. You'll see me, I'll be wearing the same outfit. Oh, my hair will look just like this you, because I'm doing it pretty much in one sitting, but I'm dividing up the topic um, uh, so that you can um, understand it as sort of some discrete ideas and units. Um, let me explain that racism is such a central topic uh, of discussion in the United States. Uh, race, as we have constructed it in the United States, which is more than a little complicated, we're going to read some stuff about that, um, is such a big topic. I could teach nothing but this for a whole year. Um, uh, to students and still not cover it. Uh, America has uh, done things differently than other countries related to an idea of race. Um, and uh, I am, um, my background that I bring to this uh, is that I have had scholarly papers published and presented at conferences about what's something called whiteness studies. And we're gonna talk about this idea of whiteness. Um, and I'm going to, uh, uh, talk to you about whiteness, just so you understand, is how white people perceive themselves and also the political structures that make it so that white people sometimes get treated differently than black people in different social situations. Um, all of this fits under the umbrella of whiteness. And I write particularly about whiteness and literature um, and whiteness and rhetoric, which is at the center of what we study in English 102. Um, and so, uh, and, and uh, my first uh, book uh, of creative work, The White Trash Pantheon, uh, won a prize from the Southern Writers Southern Writing Conference, which pretty impressive for a girl originally from South Brooklyn. Uh, they gave me the prize because um, uh, I talked about the South in a way that they felt not just skilled, but deeply authentic. Um, I am thrilled to be called a Southern writer. Um, it is, it's practically a proof of divine intervention for me because it was something I always read Southern authors and I always wanted to be one. And I love the South. I love the people of the South. I love the culture of the South. But like any um, responsible person who belongs to a culture and I, you know, I'm what you might even call a carpetbagger. I have a blog, an old blog called the Carpetbaggers Journal still up on on the web I, I don't have an attitude in years but um about my culture shock moving south which was considerable um nevertheless um whiteness uh it it, it is is a subject that i i've i've studied uh up close and i want to be very clear as someone a, allow a yankee uh transplanted to the south become a southern writer by a miracle of god praise the lord to tell you that racism is by no means a Southern phenomenon in the United States. It certainly had a character and flavor in the South. And it is by no means correct to say that racism doesn't exist in Arizona, California, um, the state of Maine, uh, Montana. Um, uh, Louisiana, though, has its own specific history associated with whiteness and with uh with 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 uh racism um and so let me say since i've told you this much the subject of racism is so big i can't teach it to you in a year and anti-racism as a subject is so big that i can't teach it to you in a year so what can i do with you for a unit which is like not even a, a third of our class exactly um i can get us started and I think that the place for me to do that is to talk to you about some definitions of terms that are useful. First of all, I think you've heard the word racism used, and I don't believe you have zero idea of what racism is. Um, we're going to talk in greater detail about what it includes. But let me briefly talk to you about the idea of 
anti-racism, which is our department's unit on um, this subject. It is not racism, but anti-racism that we are discussing. Um, let me start with, a, with briefly talking about racism that resides in one's heart, whoever one is. If I am racist in my heart, that means I think a group of people uh, is, uh, is inferior to, to another group of people based on race. And if I have an absence of that feeling at any conscious level, that doesn't mean that I'm an anti-racist. It just means I'm not going to think about it. You know, I want to watch some Kardashians on, on, on the E! Network. I don't really care. You know, that's not anti-racist. Um, anti-racism involves a uh, decision to confront and try to avoid both societally and personally an attitude of racism, which is always based on a lot because I promise you, whoever you are, you have wonderful qualities, I am sure. But the color of your skin is probably not your very best quality if you're any good. Um, whoever you are, whatever your skin color. Um, so anti-racism then is a willingness to confront racism intellectually and to decide to do something to defy the expectations of, expectations of racism or to try to dismantle in some way racism. Not people, not groups, but racism. A, a, a construction that is ultimately a false construction for everyone. That's the first term I need to define for you because it's what we're starting to study. The second term I need to um, define for you is an editorial, which is a rhetorical term. Uh, one of the two works that I have asked you to examine so far in this class is um, uh, the, um, the, one of the two works is, is by Caroline Randall Williams. Uh, and it's about, it's an editorial that appeared in the New York Times. There's also a podcast where she talks about her editorial and reads it and a video of it. An editorial is not the same thing. We're going to do study this at greater length as a, uh, researched reporting piece. Um, uh, in other words, if I want to determine, um, in a, a researched, uh, piece of journalism that let's say the mayor of a small town in Northern Louisiana is a car thief. Well, I can't just say in a newspaper without committing um, a, a legal uh, tort uh, called slander uh, that that mayor is a car thief. I have to have some kind of evidence for it. Um, and therefore, I have to do a lot of research. I have to have multiple sources that all confirm. I have to have some kind of evidence. I cannot accuse in a newspaper without researched evidence that the mayor has been shown to be a car thief. And as a journalist, I may not even be qualified to say he's a car thief. I may say that investigators have found that he is a car thief. In other words, he's now in handcuffs and in jail because he's a car thief. And uh, I'll quote uh, the district attorney for the town saying, yeah, this guy is a car thief or the district attorney probably more likely for the parish. Um, I cannot make that up. Uh, that's not uh, even allowed in journalism. Um, what is allowed though, is I can write an editorial. Let's say I keep noticing the mayor around town with new cars that look like they're newly painted and they bizarrely have like the same license plate. He keeps seeming to flip license plates. 
on the car. But have I, has the DA investigated this? Has the police arrested him? No. I just keep seeing him like first with a Lamborghini, then with some kind of Tesla thing that's like next generation. And then like with like an antique Porsche. And he like makes like something like $40,000 a year as the mayor of this small town. That's it. So how has he got all these sports cars? I can write an editorial that maybe urges the DA to investigate, but I can't say the mayor is a car thief. I can put it as a question. Is the mayor a car thief? And a question mark. An editorial allows me to be able uh, to talk about a subject in, in, in news that I haven't yet proven. So, is the mayor a car thief? That's not illegal. I can ask that question. It's probably a really good question given the circumstances I'm able to describe. And my authority in being able to even raise the subject is that I am an eyewitness of the mayor in a Lamborghini, the mayor in a Porsche, and the mayor in a Tesla, all with the same license plate and a new paint job on each one. Is it proof that he committed a crime? I cannot say. I am not able to say. But my authority comes from experience and observation. And I might possibly be able to quote some people who aren't official to, to give that testimony. The editorial we are reading by Caroline Randall Williams brings up um, the question of Confederate monuments. And she herself is fully aware that her ancestors include Edmund Pettus, uh, a Confederate uh, general who raped um, one of her female ancestors and later acknowledged that the, the progeny, her great-grandmother, was indeed his offspring. He wouldn't have given her any you know, human rights associated with childhood. He wouldn't have been a daddy to her. In fact, quite the contrary. Um, but he acknowledged it in writing that that's how that child had such light skin. And so she talks about Confederate monuments to Confederate generals in this editorial on the basis of that experience. Um, what she says may be something that shocks your conscience. And she talks quite frankly about sexual violence in both the podcast and in the editorial. Um, not in detail, but in frankness. Um, and um, she uh, demands we rethink things in light of the authority of her experience. Um, she's not writing a piece of reportage that talks about 24.6 people in the town of such and such want to get rid of the monuments or get, keep them up. It's not that kind of information. It's an argument. Your first essays um, uh, in this class will involve this kind of consideration, um, a persuasive kind of writing. Um, there's another term that I want to define. A Pauline epistle. A Pauline epistle. If you've been a good Sunday school student, I mean, not like, you know, first level Sunday school, but like you could practically be a substitute teacher at this point for Sunday school at church. You probably know what a Pauline epistle is. In the Bible, there are a variety of letters in the New Testament that are written by uh, the Apostle Paul, often from jail, about the... Um, the, the mission of the church and what the church should be doing, what it shouldn't be doing. He sometimes talks about his captivity by the Roman government, which is uh, only on the basis of his belief system and the fact that he will not sacrifice to Roman gods. And um, he has not committed an act of violence. He has been a peaceful man who has been not afraid to speak truth to power 
And so he's imprisoned and he writes all these letters. He is literally in historic, we know this historically, he's in a very small cell in Rome and he is chained. Like imagine if you had a chain on your, your, your um, wrist and it's connected to a Roman guard who literally never leaves your side. Like because you are both locked up together that, you know, with maybe a foot of chain or two feet of chain between you. And he writes these letters. He's free to send letters. He's just not free to go. And eventually the Romans kill him. Well, they're a very important part of uh, the New Testament. And I bring up the Pauline epistle as a structural form, a rhetorical form, because Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is actually also known as the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who writes an important document, a truly important document. During uh, his uh, period of incarceration for nonviolent protest uh, in Birmingham, Alabama, in the early 1960s, and he writes a letter from Birmingham jail in response to people who have written an editorial a number of white clergymen telling uh, him to, and the rest of the members of the civil rights movement to stop asking uh, for their rights through demonstrations. And he responds in a structure. If you take 1 Corinthians 13, which defines, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians, I should say, which defines love and the practice of love by the church, uh, the, the love section is chapter 13, but it's truly about how love is practiced and applied and defined by the church. The structure rhetorically truly resembles what Dr. King did. He wasn't sitting there with a Bible. In fact, he had no access to a book at all. But this man used to preach every Sunday from memory. You may well imagine he mostly had 1 Corinthians memorized. Um, and um, he sits there and he writes a letter that both defines the terms of engagement of a nonviolent civil rights movement and also how um, freedom in America might be defined. Freedom and love sort of have a similar sort of solo in, in, in the song that is the epistle in either case. Um, I ask you to consider this. And I ask, when you read the letter from Birmingham Jail, and I ask you also to consider something uh, that Dr. King says um, about um, why changing racist policies and practices in America can't wait. And he talks about taking a child to an amusement park. Um, pay extra careful attention to that passage. It will ultimately lead us to the next thing that we're going to talk about. Um, a letter from Birmingham jail is a historical document. Everyone agrees. I'm, if you haven't been taught to read this, um, this, this letter sometime during your college education, I consider it a great scandal. It's an important American document. Um, also, the, the, the Caroline Randall Williams uh, editorial was published in July, so it's not historical, but nothing could be a more stark confrontation of racism in history in the United States than this particular work. Um, in her podcast interview, uh, Caroline Randall Williams talks about um, shaming, naming and shaming one's ancestors. And I want to address that. That is her term for something that I think is worth doing if you're anti-racist. But I don't believe you have to shame your ancestors in a sense that would make you ever feel ashamed if your ancestors did anything you weren't proud of. I, I'm going to try as often as I can to frame these things about anti-racism with my own heart and my own ancestors. That way you know, I'm not shaming your mama. I might be shaming mine. <laughs> 
as a way, <coughs> I beg your pardon, to talk about the problem that Caroline Randall Williams brings up. And I feel I should um, disclose this. I know Caroline Randall Williams personally. She and I have had cocktails together more than once. And uh, she stayed as a guest at my house. And um, she and I did a, a reading together in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania from our books. I'm, I'm also a poet, uh, as she is. Uh, her first book was called Lucy Negro Redux. And I read from my book, um, the White Trash Pantheon, which um, was uh, also, um, uh, to some degree, a confrontation of history. So, um, what I want to say about her idea of shaming is that I wouldn't call it that myself. What she's really suggesting that we do is that we confront the past which in fact is part of an anti-racist uh, practice. In order for me to be able to acknowledge other people's perspectives and feelings, I have to understand what happened before. And even if I personally did nothing wrong, I should know about it. And if people who looked like me did something that I think is wrong to do, I should be able to understand that that's a problem if they got away with it because they look like me. Um, an anti-racist perspective does not make me responsible for Edmund Pettus's rape of Caroline Randall Williams' uh, great-great-grandmother. I don't feel personally responsible, but I am able to understand what she tells me about it because I have confronted history. We're my own ancestors. Again, I'm putting it in my story so that you don't feel like I'm confronting you or telling you that you should spit on your grandmother. Don't spit on your grandmother. Your grandmother was nice to you. Be respectful to your grandma. But I will, again, so that no one takes what I'm saying as a personal accusation, particularly because I was born up north, even though I'm considered a Southern writer, that nobody decides that I'm telling you that I hate your grandma because I don't, or your grandpa, or any of that. My ancestors. My ancestors didn't own slaves. Mostly they were Irish. And mostly uh, they were urban dwellers, um, urban city dwellers. And one of my ancestors, my great, great uncle, maybe I'm missing a great, anyway, my grandpa's uncle, <laughs> he was a very corrupt Irish police officer who was stationed in Chinatown. And he took uh, money from the Chinese Tongs, which are like a group of mobsters that did bad things, like they were drug pushers and they forced girls into sex trafficking from China, within Chinatown. And... When I found out he had been doing that, I didn't feel personally responsible for it. It wasn't me who had done it. I'm not a sex trafficker. I'm not a drug dealer. And I'm not profiting from either of those things in any direct fashion or demanding money <laughs> to keep quiet and not arrest people because of it. But my, um, my grandpa's uncle did that. And I think that, that stinks. I think it was awful he did that. And I decided there was, um, I was invited to give a poetry reading um, in San Francisco's Chinatown, where he had been the, uh, the corrupt cop. I was invited by a Chinese cultural association to share my poetry because I'd won a prize. And I was even like in a newspaper in Chinese. Um, and uh, it was like a really cool event. But I recognized that it was not morally right, in my view, not to do something to make amends when these people had been unbelievably welcoming to me. And let's be honest, I didn't do anything bad, but my, my grandpa's uncle really stunk. He was bad. He, what he did was wrong. And that doesn't make me ashamed of me, but it does make me ashamed of the thing he did and feel that if he, since my, my 
Grandpa's uncle will never apologize for it. I wrote a letter. I gave a small contribution to the Cultural Association that, that keeps track of history in San Francisco's Chinatown. And I told the story of my uh, grandpa's uncle, who's long since deceased, and I explained what he had done. And I said on behalf of my family to the families of Chinatown, I am very sorry that we contributed in any way to the oppression of people in a racist system that was also a sexist system because teenage girls getting sex trafficked is a super sexist thing. Um, and I gave them, you know, it wasn't a ton of money. It was something. Uh, and um, I didn't need them to do anything special about the letter. I thought that I owed it to them, though, just as a way of acknowledging the past, which included racist actions that had been done in a system which engenders racist actions, but that's no excuse. We all have personal agency. We all can choose who we're gonna be every single day of our lives. Um, and so when she talks about naming and shaming, I don't want you to go spit on anybody's tomb. I really don't. But I'm asking you to consider her idea which is not about shaming in the sense of you bad person or to take personal responsibility for stuff you personally don't or do or haven't ever done. But an acknowledgement that just as she in her um, editorial confronts both the part of her that is African and the part of her that is a, um, a rapist of Africans, that both things uh, uh, exist in her history. Acknowledging one's history and the history of one's community is useful. It sets us free from the past because we've acknowledged it. I am a better person and I owe no cosmic debt in my personal view to the Chinese American Cultural Association that so very kindly asked me to give a poetry reading for them while they fed me an unbelievably good lunch. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I, I have done something honorable because I intend not to be a racist. I am an anti-racist. I am not telling you how to live your life, but I wanted you to understand what she's talking about. What she is definitely not talking about, uh, she's shared this idea with me personally, but she, I, she's, uh, I asked her if she could uh, come talk to us on Zoom or something, or, or Google Meet, and she, she, I think she's shy about talking about this this much. Um, she's not asking you to spit on your grave or the grave of somebody else or, you know, nothing like that. But she is asking us as a community to think about the past differently and to see ourselves as people who have inherited both good and bad things from the past, whoever we are. And where we don't like the attitudes or the actions of people in the past in our community, we should say we are rejecting those actions. We are rejecting those attitudes because they do not represent the best in us. We can do something better next time. And now is the next time. So I wrote a letter. I'm not telling you to do anything. There's no assignment associated with it, but I wanted to explain what she was talking about. And it, my letter was anti-racist. There are many ways to be anti-racist. I'm not telling you what to do, but what she's not telling you to do is spit on anybody's grave. And I wanted to be super clear about that because for her to even do that to her um, uh, Confederate ancestor who raped her, um, her, her great-great-grandmother, would be complicated because she'd sort of be spitting on her own grave um, because that blood's in her too. We are all part of a society that has made huge racist mistakes and the anti-racism unit is about us trying to cut it out <laughs> in our very imperfect way. I have said more than enough. This video is super long and sadly I'm going to say more in a bit.